Welcome to Electro Online. Now let's try a slightly more challenging problem. Again, we're going to solve a source-free parallel RCL circuit. But when you look at the sketch, you go, well, wait a minute, there's a source in there. But then there's also a switch in there which closes at t equals zero. Notice, once the switch closes, the source will push current through the 30 ohm resistor, but then through the short and back to the source. So the left side of the circuit will be separated from the right side of the circuit, and it will also act independently because the current will be pushed to that short as well. So essentially, it's like you have two separate circuits, and we can si simply deal them with this portion of the circuit. Well, we're supposed to find the initial voltage across the capacitor, the initial current through the inductor, and the equation for the voltage as a function of time. Now notice we have the current through the inductor drawn from right to left. And we realize that before we close the switch, the source will drive current through the circuit this way. So why do we indicate the current through the inductor from right to left? Well, it turns out that by convention in an RCL source-free circuit where the components are parallel to one another, we draw the current from the positive voltage of the capacitor through the inductor, which is therefore from right to left. But the initial current will go from left to right, so the initial current will be a negative quantity relative to the direction of that arrow, so we have to keep that in mind. So first of all, the initial voltage. V initial across the capacitor. Now notice, before the switch closes, the current will go through this resistor, through the inductor, which is essentially is short at that time, and then through the both paths, but once the capacitor is filled up, all the current will go to the 50 ohm resistor and we have a voltage divider. The voltage across the capacitor will be equal to the voltage across the resistor. So the voltage across the capacitor initially will be 50 divided by the sum of the two, 30 plus 50, multiplied times the voltage of the source, which is 4 volts. So this is 5 over 8 times 4 volts, which is 2.5 volts. All right, now the initial current. I initial is equal to the voltage of the source divided by the, the total oop, source divided by the total resistance. This, the source voltage is 4 volts, but notice that the current will be driven in the opposite direction of the arrow, so it will be minus the source voltage of 4 volts divided by the, let's see here, yep, 80 ohms, the total resistance is 80 ohms, which is equal to uh, 4, that's uh, 0 0.05, minus 0 0.05 amps. Okay, so now we know the initial voltage and the initial current. Now we need to figure out what kind of circuit we're dealing with. Is it an overdamped, critically damped, or underdamped circuit? So what we're going to do is calculate alpha. Alpha is equal to 1 over 2RC, which is equal to 1 divided by 2 times the resistance, that's just 50, and the capacitance is 20 times 10 to the minus 6. So let's see what that is equal to. That's 100 times 20 E6 minus equals, take the inverse of that, 500. So alpha is equal to 500. And then omega sub naught, which of course is the natural frequency of the circuit if there's no resistance there. Okay, so what does that equal to? Oh, I didn't write it down. 1 over the square root of LC which is equal to 1 over the square root of L, which is 0 0.4, and C, which is 20 times 10 to the minus 6, which is equal to, see, 0.4 times 20 E6 minus equals, take the square root, take the inverse, and it's 353.55. Let's call it 353.6. All right, clearly, Alpha is larger than omega sub naught, which means that we have an overdamped system. And if it's overdamped, then the equation for the voltage as a function of time becomes the following. It is equal to A1 times e to the S1t plus A2 e to the S2t. 
So the first thing we need to do is find those two exponents, S1 and S2. So we can find S1 and S2 to be equal to minus alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus omega sub naught squared. So for the first one, S1 is equal to minus alpha, that would be minus 500 plus, we'll take the plus part, times the square root of 500 squared minus omega sub naught squared, which is 353.6 squared. All right. So let's square that, subtract that from 500 squared equals, take the square root of that. Ooh, look at that. So that's equal to, let's go over here, minus 500 plus 353.6, which in this case, we get 146.4 minus 146.4 for S1. S2 will then, of course, be minus 500 minus 353.6, which is therefore minus 853.6. So we have S1 and S2. We can plug that into the equation. So we get the voltage as a function of time, which is equal to A1 times E to the minus 146.4T plus A2 E to the minus 853.60. Okay. All we have left to do now is find the values for A1 and A2. So we'll start off by saying that V initial, which is equal to 2.5, is going to be equal to this equation when T is equal to 0. E to the 0, of course, becomes 1. That means we simply have A1 plus A2. So we have our first equation that tells us that 2.5 is equal to the sum of A1 plus A2. Now we need to find the derivative of the voltage when the voltage is equal to zero or when time is equal to zero of dt. So dv dt when time equals zero. That's essentially what we're finding. And we know that it's equal to minus the initial voltage plus the initial current times r divided by rc. Okay, so that's equal to minus the initial voltage is 2.5 plus the initial current, which is a minus 0 0.05 times the resistance, which is 50, divided by 50 times 20 times 10 to the minus 6. But if you look at it, 50 times this gives us minus 2.5 plus 2.5 that actually is equal to 0. So now what we can do is we can take the derivative of this, which is dv dt, which is equal to minus 146.4 A1 e to the minus 146.4 T minus 853.6 A2 e to the minus 853.6 T. So once we take the derivative of this, and then we say that when time equals zero, it's equal to zero, we can then say that the VDT when time equals to zero, is equal to zero, is equal to, plug in zeros for the t's, then all we have is, we get minus 146.4 A1 minus 853.6 A2. And there's our second equation that relates A1 to A2. So, what we can do is we can, let's say that A2 is equal to 2.5 minus A1 and plug that in here. So 0 equals minus 146.4 A1 minus 853, well let me go like this, I don't have to put parentheses yet, 853.6. Instead of A2, we're going to write 2.5 minus A1. Which means this times this added to this. That's a minus times a minus is a plus. So 853.6 minus 146.4. That gives us 707.2A1 is equal to its 853.6 times 2.5, then move to the other side becomes plus. So we have 853.6 times 2.5, which is 2134. 
then we divide that by 707.2 and we have A1 to be equal to 3.02. So A1 is equal to 3.02, A2 is equal to 2.5 minus A1, so A2 equals 2.5 minus A1, which is 3. Point, well, let's call it 3.0. So 2.5 minus that, we have A2 is equal to minus 0.5. So now we have A1 and we have A2. And I need some room somewhere, so we'll put it right there. So let me try to get out of the way here. So the voltage as a function of time is equal to A1. A1 was 3 point, let's call it 3, times E. To the minus 146.4t and then we have plus a2 and a2 is a minus 0 0.5 so minus 0 0.5 e to the minus 853.6 and there we have the equation that gives us the voltage with respect to time we have two constants a1 and a2 and S1 and S2 for the exponential portion. And that is then the equation we were looking for based upon these initial conditions. And that is how it's done.